Welcome to UC Riverside College of Natural and Agricultural Sciences 2022 Science Lecture Series on Big Data Science. My name is Sunny True, and I am a CMAS Science Ambassador in my fourth year as a UCR student, majoring in biochemistry. Before we get started with today's presentation, we at UCR would like to respectfully acknowledge and recognize our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of the land, water, and air, the Kawinya, Tongva, the Seno, and the Serrano people, and all of their ancestors and descendants, past, present, and future. Today, this meeting place is home to many indigenous, indigenous peoples from, our, from all over the world, including UCR faculty, students, and staff, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on these homelands. And now I would like to bring up CNAS. CNAS Dean Catherine Garrett. Thank you, Sunny, for the introduction. So as Sunny mentioned, my name is Catherine Garrett, and I have the distinct honor of serving as the Dean of the College of Natural and Agricultural Sciences at UCR. It is a mouthful, Sunny. Uh, welcome to the 2022 Science Lecture Series on Big Data Science. I'd like to welcome guests that are joining us both virtually and here in person on campus. Uh, we have guests um, that are students, faculty, staff, as well as UCR alumni, admitted students and their families, members out of the Riverside community. We have a very large group, both in person and online. And because Dr. Kane will be presenting on the plurality of worlds, searching for life in a universe of data, we welcome guests from beyond. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> okay, so that didn't work. So year after year, the science lecture series takes on topics that are relevant and critical to each and every single one of us. Big data science is no exception. Many of you can relate in your everyday lives how technologies collect and analyze data in ways that we have never imagined. So the big data that those technologies generate has transformed not only how scientists do their research, but also how we view our world and other worlds. So we, before we bring up Dr. Stephen Kane, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today, uh, Dr. Eddie Schwederman. Dr. Schwederman is an astrobiologist at UCR whose primary research interest is searching for signs of life on dis distant worlds. He received his Bachelor of Science degrees in physics and astronomy and astrophysics at the Florida Institute of Technology, and then his master's and PhD degrees in astronomy and astrobiology at the University of Washington. Dr. Sweeterman simulates the climate, atmospheric chemistry, and spectral observables of terrestrial exoplanets. He is particularly interested in work that can inform our ability to characterize Earth-sized planets in the habitable zones of their host stars in search of remotely detectable biosignatures. This sounds so impressive. So in addition to the work that he's already done continuing, he leads new NASA funded research efforts at UCR to simulate the atmospheres of Earth-like planets orbiting M dwarf stars. So Dr. Sweeterman, please come join me on stage and everyone please welcome, uh, help me in welcoming our moderator. Thank you so much for that very kind and thoughtful introduction, uh, D. Eric. Um, as I introduced our speaker, I want to talk a little bit about the department um, that Dr. King and I share here at UCR, Earth and Planetary Sciences. Uh, what's wonderful about our department is that we have such an immense interdisciplinarity. And our speaker tonight, Dr. Kane, is a prime example of that interdisciplinarity. Among the ranks in Earth and Planetary Sciences, sciences are seismologists, climate scientists, uh, geologists, geochemists, planetary scientists, and paleontologists and exoplanet astronomers. We study processes that take place from the vacuum of space to the crushing pressures of planetary interiors, and from below freezing temperatures to the plasmas in our ionized thermosphere, and over time scales ranging from atomic transitions to the entire geologic histories of Earth and other planets. We tackle the most pressing societal issues, including predicting and preparing for earthquakes and helping our society mitigate and adapt to the challenge of climate change. We also confront the most compelling and invigorating intellectual questions. Where did we come from? How did we get here? And are we alone? Members of our department study the evidence for the earliest microbial life on Earth and how this life indelibly altered our atmosphere 
from a toxic carbon dioxide and methane rich uh, a choked broth to the breathable oxygen rich atmosphere we enjoy today. Our paleobiologists study the evolution of the earliest life and the greatest mass extinctions in our planet's history. And our paleoclimate scientists examine the record of past climate change and life's adaptation to those changes in order to better predict the consequences of a warming world. The last question, are we alone? And the search for life in the universe is what motivates this talk, the plurality of worlds searching for life in the universe. There are now over 5,000 exoplanetary uh, systems confirmed and thousands of candidates yet to be confirmed among the billions of exoplanets we expect in our galaxy alone. How can we search for life in this overwhelming cosmic ocean of data? I can think of no better person to answer that question and to give this presentation than Dr. Stephen Kane. Dr. Kane is a professor of planetary astrophysics here at UCR. Um, he received his bachelor's degree from Macquarie University in Sydney and his PhD from the University of Tasmania. His work is impressively diverse, ranging from exoplanet characterization and detection to the gravitational and dynamic stability of exoplanetary systems to the habitable zones of, exoplan of, of, of exoplanetary systems and comparative planetology within our solar system, including the differences between Earth and Venus and why they are so different today. He is a prominent scientific leader of several NASA missions designed to search for life in the universe, and he's published hundreds of peer-reviewed scientific articles and several books on the topics of exoplanets and, bio and uh, habitability. On a more personal note, Stephen is an incredibly personable, approachable, and engaging speaker. He loves answering audience questions, so I hope you prepare a lot of them. He is quite the opposite of the stereotypical pandemic uh, learned astronomer, if you're familiar with the poem by Walt Whitman. He's the planetary scientist and astrobiologist that you can grab a beer with. And for those of you in the audience here, I encourage you to buy him that beer after the talk. <laughs> You're welcome, Stephen. <laughs> so without further delay, please welcome Dr. Stephen King. Wow, thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm gonna stop asking, can I have the lights turned off? Is that okay? At the risk of uh, putting your to sleep at the end of your day. Um, and uh, of course, the other thing I need to do is uh, share my screen. So let me just get, get that moving along while the lights are dim. All right, great. Um, so yeah, I, as I said, thank you so much for, for those introductions. And it's, it's a real, Honor to be uh, leading the science lecture series uh, this year. And on this topic of big data, uh, we're starting at the vastest scale that you can possibly imagine. Uh, you know, I've been uh, staring at pictures just like the one you see here my whole life <laughs> uh, and, uh, and wondering about uh, what, what are the prospects out there uh, and uh, I, I grew up in Outback Australia, uh, where we had fantastic views of the night sky. And for those of you who are not aware, the Southern Hemisphere points more directly at the center of our galaxy. And so uh, when I uh, take my uh, Northern Hemisphere colleagues to the Southern Hemisphere to visit a telescope, they're always amazed at the vast quantity of stars that they can see. But uh, as I said, um, I, I, I really have been looking at uh, these kinds of uh, pictures my, my whole life. And when I was a teenager growing up in Outback Australia, of course, our knowledge of the universe was very different than it is now. Uh, we did not know of planets outside of our solar system, although we long suspected that they existed. And our, our knowledge was limited to what we observed within our own planetary system. So we knew that there, there were four small planets close to the sun, uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, and four giant planets, which are further away, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And uh, one of the uh, questions that I asked as a kid and planetary scientists have been asking for a long time, is that normal? Is that a normal uh, architecture that you would expect for a planetary system? We had no way of knowing because we only had uh, 
one planetary system to base these ideas off of. And in particular, is there life out there? Uh, because we only had that one data point for, of course, the Earth. And so these have been fundamental questions uh, that have been around for a long time, of course. Trying to answer these has been overwhelming and it's because we are surrounded uh, rather frustratingly by the answers. We just can't quite grasp them. And to be able to get to that point, to be able to uh, answer these questions is an extremely daunting task because when we consider the sheer volume of space that we are trying to probe, I mean, this is a representation of our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, which is around about 200,000 light years in diameter. Estimates of the number of stars are anywhere between 100 to 400 billion stars. And so when we're faced with, with these kinds of numbers, it, it can be a question of how do we even start to approach this problem? It can feel very much like the epitome of a needle in a haystack uh, when we're trying to uh, answer this question. Uh, so to explain how we've gone on this pathway, especially over the last couple of decades uh, and, um, and how far back these questions uh, have originated, we do need to go back in time because uh, it would come as a surprise to, I'm sure, very few of you that these questions are not new. And that when we go back in time to, uh, to the ancient Greeks, there was a, uh, a Greek philosopher by the name of Epicurus. And Epicurus was one of these deep thinkers who thought a lot about this topic. And he had one of many wonderful quotes, but in particular, the quote I'm showing you here, where he said, there are infinite worlds, both like and unlike this world of ours. We must believe that in all worlds, there are living creatures and plants and other things that we see in this world. It was Epicurus who really uh, brought about this phrase, the plurality of worlds through quotes like this, this idea that there are many other planets uh, like the Earth. Now, thoughts like that were kind of revolutionary for, for the time, but they have persisted throughout history to varying degrees. And so if we move forward in time to something more recently, then we uh, find a person by the name of Giordano Bruno. Uh, Giordano Bruno was living at a very interesting time in history where there were a lot of changes happening in the way in which we see the universe. And an example of that is in the first sentence of this quote, where he says, there are countless suns and countless earths all rotating around their suns in exactly the same way as the seven planets of our system. Now you need to pause there and think for a moment, what did Giordino mean when he said the seven planets? Because we have Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn, that is six, because Uranus was not discovered until 1781, and Neptune was not discovered until 1846. They required the use of a telescope in order to know that they were there. The other planets have been known since antiquity because we have been able to see them with the naked eye. The seventh planet was the moon, because this was during a period of transition called the Copernican Revolution. The idea that, uh, that we're actually living in a heliocentric, meaning sun-centric universe, rather than a geocentric, meaning earth-centric universe. And in the geocentric universe, the moon is another planet. So that's what he meant when he said that. He went on, we see only the suns because they are the largest bodies and are luminous, but their planets remain invisible to us because they are smaller and non-luminous. The countless worlds in the universe are no worse and no less inhabited than our Earth. As I said, Jordana lived in an interesting time, which had some very many uh, good aspects in terms of the changes that were occurring, but had many bad aspects. I stand before you today speaking freely about the prospect of life on other planets, but there are periods of human history when I would be doing so at risk of my own life. And it would probably come as very little surprise to you to know that the reason that he was uh, burnt at the stake 
was because of a number of things, uh, including that very last sentence. Saying things like that were dangerous at various points in, in history. But I want to actually focus on the middle sentence because Giordano Bruno actually hit upon the answer to the question of how come we, we strongly suspect that the planets are out there, but we can't see them. What is the problem? And the problem is, as he said, they're invisible. You have a faint object next to a very, very bright object, the star it's orbiting. So any light that is emitted or, ref, uh, or uh, reflected from the planet is lost in the light of the star it's orbiting. And this is a significant problem that has plagued us and still does today in many ways and requires uh, new ways of thinking about the problem to try and solve it. So Giordano uh, identified that these planets are invisible. Okay, so we cannot see the planets directly, or at least it's difficult. What if we could see the planets indirectly? And by that, I mean the effect that the planet has on the star that it's orbiting. And there are two main ways in which we do this. So uh, the first, shown in the top animation, is a gravitational effect. So the planet has mass, and so as it's orbiting the star, it's actually causing the star to wobble. Uh, we often think about uh, planets orbiting a star or the sun, or in the case of the moon orbiting the Earth. But actually, the moon and the Earth both orbit around something called the center of mass. The moon's orbit is causing the Earth to wobble. And in the same way, planets can cause their star to wobble. So even if we can't see this, the planet, we can see the star, and maybe we can measure that motion of the star towards and away for, from us as it moves around in a circle. And so for that reason, we call it a radial velocity, velocity in the radial direction towards and away from us. The other technique, which is very, very popular, is called the transit method. That's shown in the bottom animation. And that occurs when a planet passes between us and the star. And when it does that, it blocks out very briefly some of the light from the star it's orbiting. So as it's transiting the star, it's, it's revealing its presence. But it's not just revealing that it's there. It's actually revealing something about itself. Because in the top animation, the radial velocity method, that is a gravitational effect, which means it gives you a measurement of the mass of the planet. The bottom one is a, it results in a measurement of the size of the planet. The bigger the planet, the more light it, it blocks out. And so those are the two main ways in which uh, we do indirectly infer the presence of planets around other stars. So how do we do this? Well, it's very, very, very difficult. And that's why it's, uh, it's only been the past few decades that we've been able to do this. I often refer to this as technology catching up to ideas. That is what was required in order to make this work. For the top method, the radial velocity method, we need a lot of glass. We need to use the largest telescopes that we can find in order to see this very subtle motion. And that's, uh, of, of course, where we're very uh, uh, blessed within the University of California system to have access to facilities like the Keck telescopes on Mauna Kea. And my research group is, uh, it uses this all the time. And in fact, uh, while I'm speaking to you, I'm getting messages on my phone about the observers in my group who are setting up for observing to use this telescope tonight. So uh, we use telescopes like this in the Northern and Southern hemisphere around the world to measure these slight variations of the star moving towards and away from us. Now, to make the transit method work in a way that we can actually detect that signature, we also need to advance our technology to make that work. Because in order to measure the change in brightness of a star to the sensitivity in order to uh, to detect the presence of a planet is actually extremely difficult, especially from the ground. Because I often liken it to when you see an object at the bottom of the pool, then the turbulence in the water makes that object seem to move around. That's what it's like um, uh, trying to measure the brightness of stars. When we are observing stars through the Earth's atmosphere, 
that Earth's atmosphere is making them move all over the place, which is why they twinkle. That's why stars are twinkling because of the effect of the Earth's atmosphere. Beautiful, the source of rhymes that we know and that we love are terrible for astronomers who have long since wanted to get rid of the Earth's atmosphere, which is why they shouldn't be in charge of too much. <laughs> so what do we do about this problem? Well, so we design very, very large detectors using the most sensitive of CCDs, charge couple devices. You all have one of these in the camera of your phone. Uh, these were, uh, what's shown here is 42 custom designed uh, detectors uh, that were specifically designed for the purpose of measuring the brightness of stars. Altogether, it covers an area of the sky, which is about 100 square degrees. For reference, the diameter of the moon is about half a degree. So this is a fairly large area of the sky in which we can continuously monitor about 170,000 stars continuously. But like I said, we don't want to use this from the ground. That would be almost a waste. And so what we did back in 2009 was we put that into a telescope and we launched it into space. In 2009, we launched the very first NASA mission, which was dedicated entirely to the purpose of discovering planets around, the, around other stars, specifically planets which are the size of the Earth. The aim of this mission was a statistical mission of trying to answer the question of how common are planets the size of the Earth around other stars, specifically those kinds of planets that might have surface liquid water and the potential for life. And so when we deployed this telescope, we didn't uh, put it in low Earth orbit like the Hubble Space Telescope. Instead, we put it into what we call an Earth trailing orbit. So it followed the Earth around the sun. And the reason that we did that was so that the Kepler telescope, as it was called, could stare continuously at this patch of sky and teach us uh, about whether those stars had planets or not. So this resulted in a lot of data. This is showing follow-up data from a different facility called the Spitzer Space Telescope, but it has a similar kind of look and feel to the data that we were receiving from Kepler. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of measurements for hundreds of thousands of stars. And the data volume quickly uh, uh, became overwhelming. This is what we were finding in 2010 and 2011. Uh, some people likened it to trying to drink from a fire hose of data. So this is showing one example, which is the Trappist-1 system. Uh, this is a system that Eddie and I both think about a lot. Uh, and this is a system that has seven planets orbiting it. All are of more or less terrestrial in nature, meaning that they're somewhat similar in size to the Earth and they're producing these small dips. You can also see that there's data that's going upwards. This is activity from the star itself. And so this is a difficult problem when you have this large amount of data and you're trying to find the needle in the haystack that I mentioned earlier and, uh, and understand whether that's caused by a planet or whether it's caused by some ast other astrophysical effect, maybe even originates in the instrument itself. And so it has been a difficult process uh, over the years of trying to manage the data and understand the, the potential discoveries that come out of it. Was it successful? Well, uh, let me show you a few histograms of discoveries to, to really highlight where we have come as a civilization over the past few decades. So this is showing the discovery broken down by year, which you can see on the horizontal axis. And the different colors are showing the different ways in which we find planets. Now, you can see that the two main methods that have been used to find planets are the two that I've introduced you to. Uh, the red is the radial velocity, that is the motion of the star, and green is transits. And transits was the method that, if you recall, the Kepler mission was using by staring at all of those stars. So what you can see is that the radial velocity method was dominating for many years. And I started grad school in around about 1996. 
Um, I, I, I need to be careful here. I'm not saying that the sun rising planets had anything to do with me starting grad school. I happened to be in the right place at the right time. So I was very, very fortunate in that, in that respect and managed to join the field from the ground floor. But you can see that the transit method uh, quickly started to take over. And uh, to place this in the context of the launch of the Kepler mission, I, as I said, that happened in 2009. And then uh, in the subsequent we years, we started to see the first data releases. And you can see that the, uh, that the discovery seems to peak around 2011 and then starts to drop back down again. What happened? Were we starting to run out of planets? No, we, we found that we literally had more data than we had people to process it. There was a, there became a, a, a huge swarm of new graduate students who were thankfully were brought in, into the fray, uh, who were very enthusiastic about the, about the new discoveries that were happening. But there was a period there when we were struggling to keep up with the data and understand it. But you can see that this only goes up to 2013, which is almost 10 years ago. So we need to update this. So this is what it looks like now. Uh, I updated this just a few days ago. And there's a, a couple of things to note here uh, that you can see that there are these two spikes at 2014 and 2016. Like I said, we were trying to understand the data and that was a struggle, but we overcame that struggle and we managed to understand the data in new ways. And so we saw a dramatic increase in the number of discoveries that were happening from Kepler. So this was great. But then in, in subsequent years, uh, uh, we're seeing the number of planets going up and down. And as Eddie mentioned, we recently crossed a significant threshold, which is that the number of known exoplanets uh, is now greater than 5,000. Now, 5,000 sounds like a large number, and it is, uh, uh, especially since we've only been doing this for a few decades now. But one thing that we can say for sure is that that is a number where we are just barely scratching the surface. In my own studies of, of planets around other stars, I can state with confidence now that all stars have planets. That is something that myself and, and many colleagues feel quite confident in saying now. In fact, it's difficult to imagine processes whereby the formation of a star in the material around it would not result in the coalition of planetary material. So that's, uh, that's one thing. But the reason that I, I, I say that this is barely scratching the surface is because for those of you who are paying attention to the way in which the transit method works, you would know that, wait a minute, in order for a planet to transit its star, we need to be observing that orbit exactly from the right direction. And that means that for every planet we see transit, we, uh, there are many planets which don't transit. And so uh, I sometimes joke that uh, with the transit method to first order, we're actually detecting nothing <laughs> from a statistical point of view. But we have 5,000, and it means that there are billions more planets. I spoke to you earlier about the number of stars in our galaxy, and that, uh, and that um, uh, there's, uh, most stars are going to have more than one planet. And so there are billions of more planets. We are just scratching the surface. So what, are we, uh, well, what can we do? with this 5,000 planets? Well, it is a large number, and it is a number that we can start to answer some statistical questions. In particular, one of the most important, going back to what I was thinking about when I was a teenager, and uh, what people like Epicurus and uh, Giordano Bruno were thinking about, which is, are Earth-sized planets rare or are they common? When we look at our planetary system, is that normal or is it not normal? Well, we can answer this now by looking at just the Kepler data set. So here is a, uh, a, a diagram which is summarizing the results of Kepler. And you can see on the horizontal axis, there's the orbital period, the time it takes for the planet to orbit its star. And on the vertical axis is the size relative to Earth. So there we've got units 
of it shows Earth at one. Neptune is about 3.9 uh, Earth radii, we'll call it four. And uh, Jupiter is about 11.2 Earth radii, we'll call it 10. We've got these uh, order, nice orders of magnitude right here within our solar system that we can use as measuring sticks. So here's what we can see. As I said to you earlier, a larger planet would cause a greater effect on its star. That means that large planets are the low hanging fruit and we'll find those first. So when we look at this diagram, we see that the large planets, it's relatively sparse. And so the question you can ask is, is that real or is that an observational effect? Because those planets are the easiest to find, that's real. That means that these kinds of giant planets are relatively rare. But as we start to go down towards Earth size, you can see that the density of points increases. So it's increasing until we get to the bottom right, where you can see that there is a, a uh, it seems to run out. That's not uh, uh, us running out of Earth sized planets. That is reaching the limitations of the Kepler uh, detector. So that's where we can no longer produce precise enough measurements. But what we observe is that this, the distribution continues to increase as we go to smaller sizes, which is somewhat intuitive because when you consider a pile of rubble, you expect to have uh, a few of the large boulders and then more of the, 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 the larger rocks and then more of the smaller rocks. And by the time you get to the grain of sands, you can no longer count them anymore. Turns out planet formation works in a very similar way and that you get much fewer of the giant planets than you do of the smaller planets. But in particular, it tells us the important point, which is that Earth-sized planets, terrestrial planets are common and are amongst the most common types of planet in the universe. So this is wonderful news. Uh, but the question is, how can we learn more about these kinds of planets? Because what we then want to do is understand the atmospheres of these planets. This is where we need to move on to even more advanced techniques because it turns out the transit method has an additional uh, byproduct which is extremely useful for us. And that is when the light from the star is heading towards us and the planet transits the star, it means that the light of that star passes through the atmosphere of the planet on its way to us. And as it passes through the atmosphere, the chemical composition of the atmosphere can be revealed because depending on the species, the molecular species which are in the atmosphere, they will absorb at particular wavelengths. And this is an extremely useful feature of the transit method, which enables us to, uh, to determine what the atmosphere might be made of. So, that's, uh, that is currently being done and we're heading more in that direction. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. But what we, uh, what we learn or what we're hoping to learn uh, from looking at the atmosphere of a planet uh, is uh, essentially determining what the surface conditions might be like. And in particular, if there is uh, evidence of uh, biochemistry occurring on the planet, then it might reveal itself because of the uh, metabolic processes and how that interacts with the atmosphere. And to see an example of that, we only need to look at the only example we have, which is the Earth, because we know that the, uh, that the biological processes on the Earth have had a profound effect on the, uh, on the Earth's atmosphere, in particular things like the rise of oxygen, uh, which have occurred through time. And so when we look at the Earth's atmosphere, we see all kinds of interesting features. When we look at ultraviolet wavelengths, we see the effect of ozone, so important in protecting us uh, from the uh, ultraviolet radiation, which is why we see the absorption there. But we see other signatures of oxygen. We also see the effects of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is uh, a product of both biology and geology through volcanic outgassing. We see the effects of vegetation and methane, uh, which can also be produced by biological processes on the earth. But I want to draw your attention to down here, we see water vapor, and you see it says suggest habitability. And I want to spend a few moments talking to you about that, about planetary habitability. Because one of the ways in which we're approaching this problem, because as I, as I said, this is an enormous data problem. 
about how we're going to look for life around other stars. And uh, one of the ways we can approach this is by parameterizing it in a way that helps us to find the most probable locations. So we like to talk about uh, liquid water, in particular surface liquid water, because we have an abundance of that on the Earth. And we know that uh, uh, liquid water is essential for all life on Earth. We know that, uh, that the life on Earth probably started in the oceans. And uh, so there are a lot of uh, people who, who say, you know, wherever you find uh, water on the Earth, you find life. Uh, that on its own isn't particularly convincing because at this point, after four and a half uh, billion years, life has contaminated everything on the planet. So we're Wherever you find any anything on Earth, you find life. <laughs> this is why we need to work so hard to decontaminate everything we send to Mars, because life is just so prevalent. It's actually hard to get rid of it, even if you want to. But water has been extremely important for life on Earth. It has a lot of great uh, 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 attributes to it. Uh, one is that it's uh, it's liquid at a uh, at a reasonably high temperature. You could think of other possible solvents in which you could have biochemistry, but they're usually much cooler when they're in a liquid state, so the biochemistry will occur much slower. We also know that uh, water is extremely common. Hydrogen, oxygen on their own, two of the most common elements in the universe, and water is a very, very common hydrocarbon. We see it throughout the solar system, actually, uh, particularly the outer parts of the solar system. We've, uh, we've observed it in the interstellar medium, uh, we know that water is very, very common. So the question you can then ask is, how can we determine if a planet might have surface liquid water, maybe even oceans like the Earth? Well, the answer is it's complicated. And uh, this forms a large part of my research when we're thinking about all of the various factors that can influence the presence of surface liquid water. Uh, and this is, by the way, this is a diagram, which is sometimes colloquially referred to as the planets are hard diagram. Uh, it's it's uh, almost intended to be an intimidation of uh, how, how complicated the whole subject is. Uh, and so what we can do is we can break it down into these three areas of the stars, uh, the, the planetary system and the planetary properties itself. So for example, for stars, uh, we can start to ask the question, are stars like the, the sun common? Kind of, except uh, the M-dwarf stars that, that uh, Eddie uh, researches so much are the most common. And so stars like the sun aren't necessarily where we expect to find most of the biosignatures because there are other stars that are much more common. Stars change a lot during their lifetime. There's a lot of things to consider there. Uh, stars do not remain static. Uh, and they can have all kinds of effects on a planetary atmosphere as they age. So there's questions like, like that we can ask. In terms of the planetary system, going back to the question I asked at the beginning, is the architecture of the solar system normal? The answer is no. The architecture of our solar system appears to be unusual. Four small planets closer in, four giant planets further out. I've already indicated to you that giant planets are rare, but in particular, having a giant planet further out where Jupiter is, seems to be unusual. Is that important for habitability? Maybe because Jupiter has taken a lot of impacts that would have otherwise hit the Earth. And so that could be important. What is the effect of changing orbits? The orbits of our planets have changed through time and even the Earth's orbit has changed through time through and producing what we call Milankovitch cycles in the Earth's climate. So there's all those things to consider. But for the, for the planet itself, this is the most uh, important, of course, uh, because the planet uh, has intrinsic properties that can really define what its evolution will be like, uh, whether it's too small or too large, whether it has too much surface liquid water, which, believe it or not, is possible if you have an ocean planet without continents. Uh, and how are these surface conditions changing through time? Now, uh, one of the challenges we face in this whole subject, of course, is that we have the case of the Earth. We see the Earth at the present epoch. It's a nice place to live. It has uh, 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 surface liquid water. And one of the most remarkable things about the Earth is that it has had surface liquid water for almost its entire history of four and a half billion years. But what we need 
is another example. If only we had another Earth-sized planet that would show a different possibility of planetary evolution. Well, the universe in this sense has been extremely kind to us because the Earth, uh, sorry, the universe provided with us a sister planet, which is of course Venus. This is a picture of, uh, of Venus, beautiful picture of the clouds on Venus that was taken by the Japanese Akatsuki spacecraft back in 2010. It is a, a planet of great beauty, which is why it's named after the goddess of beauty and love, Venus uh, uh, from Roman mythology. Uh, and for many years, even up until the 60s, we speculated about whether Venus might have life on the surface. But we now know that if we take away the clouds, it looks something like this. So it has a completely barren surface where uh, the surface pressure is about uh, 93 times the surface pressure on the Earth because the atmosphere is so thick. That's equivalent to being at an ocean depth of around about a kilometer, way below the safe, safe scuba diving depth. It also has a surface temperature of about 850 degrees Fahrenheit which I recently discovered is the maximum temperature on the temperature gauge of my barbecue. If I heat it up. Bad things happen if it goes beyond that. So, so and it also has uh, sulfuric acid in the atmosphere. This is almost the epitome of a non-inhabitable environment. And so you can ask yourself, how did we get the, from one state of affairs to another, especially as there is very good evidence now that Venus did once look like this. And so uh, as recently, perhaps as a billion years ago, Venus could have had surface liquid water. And so what we're trying to do is, is understand what was it that went wrong? And that will be one of the keys in, in us understanding planetary habitability. Because it is tempting to look at Venus and Earth and side by side. And people uh, made this mistake for many years, looking at them side by side, and okay, the difference is obvious because Venus is 30% closer to the sun, which means it receives twice the amount of solar energy the Earth does, and so that just heats it up. But that ignores the fact that there are many other differences between Venus and the Earth. Venus uh, is almost tidally locked to the sun, meaning it rotates very slowly, and it rotates backwards. And it has an almost vertical rotational axis, which means it doesn't experience seasons in the same way that the Earth does. It has little to no surface subduction, which is a crucial part of Earth's carbon cycle for removing carbon from the Earth's atmosphere through time. And it has a negligible magnetic field. It doesn't have a substantial moon, so it doesn't have tidal effects on the surface the way in which the Earth does. And the list goes on. And so what we are trying to do in our work is to try and understand which of these factors really matter and which of them are kind of second or third order effects. Because the way in which we look at this problem is that you have two planets the same size, probably similar starting condition, which may have been on a similar path, but there may have been one particular point in planetary evolution where they diverged and went in very different directions. That's one uh, uh, possibility. Or there could have been a variety of reasons. And so when we look at planets around other stars, when we're finding these terrestrial planets, uh, we can start to ask, does it mean you can only ever have uh, a completely inhospitable planet like Venus or a habitable planet like Earth? Or are there many possibilities in between? And of course, this is where we require even more data. And this is what's coming uh, in, in the years ahead. And so let me just uh, finish by telling you a few things about what, what is coming up uh, next, because we have some exciting times ahead, which means a lot more data, but uh, there are some great things uh, happening. So uh, for example, to answer this question about the difference between uh, Earth and Venus, there are so many things that we don't understand about Venus, despite the fact that it is our sister planet, it is the nearest planet, and we know so little about it. So fortunately, uh, we're going back and uh, uh, NASA has not visited Venus since the early 1990s with the Magellan mission. Uh, but myself and others have been pushing very, very hard on this topic of understanding Venus has been crucial to understanding the evolution 
of, um, uh, of the habitability of the Earth. And uh, finally, in the middle of last year, uh, NASA made it very clear that they agreed because uh, I'm fortunate to be on the science team for Venus missions and uh, two were selected uh, in the announcement by the NASA administrator uh, the middle of last year, Da Vinci, uh, which will be studying the atmosphere and determining whether Venus ever did have an ocean and Veritas, uh, which will be mapping the surface and trying to understand if there is sub subduction or if there ever was subduction going on at the surface, which could have been recycling the carbon in the same way as we see for the Earth at some point in its history. So this is very, very exciting. Um, and, uh, and so there's going to be a lot more uh, happening with this partnership between NASA and, and, uh, and UCR in, in, the, in the coming years. Those are projected to be launched uh, later this decade. Now, um, the other thing that's happening is that uh, in 2018, I was on the team for uh, a next generation transit survey, uh, in some ways the successor to the Kepler mission, which is the Transient Exoplanet Survey Satellite. Uh, this uh, uh, telescope is orbiting the Earth and it is observing the whole sky. Whereas Kepler stared at a patch of 100, uh, about 100 square degrees, 170,000 stars, TESS is gradually tiling around the whole sky and has been doing so for several years now. And uh, this is uh, partly why I'm using so much Keck time, uh, because we're following up on many of the discoveries of these, of these planets that transit. And then I measure the motion of the star towards and away from us and get a measurement of the mass of those planets. Uh, so that's happening uh, right now as well. But what's coming up next for that is the work that both myself and Eddie are engaged in quite a lot, which is the characterization of the atmospheres. This is the mo most exciting part in many ways, because we're finally going to understand what the composition of these atmospheres may look like. As I said, when a planet transits, we see the light pass through the atmosphere of the planet on its way to us. How can we measure that absorption? Well, we need a new telescope. And recently we got one. So uh, I don't know about, uh, about you, but uh, I stayed up very late New Year's Eve, uh, sorry, not New Year's Eve, Christmas Eve uh, last year, because the launch of the James Webb occurred about 4, 4 a.m. local time. And so uh, rather than try and get up at 4 a.m., I just stayed up playing video games until the launch happened. Uh, and fortunately, it was, it was spectacularly successful. Uh, the deployment of the James Webb Space Telescope uh, to a location called the Lagrange Point, uh, about a million miles away from the Earth, on the other uh, uh, on the other side of the Earth from the Sun, uh, uh, used less fuel than they thought it would. So it originally had a lifetime of about five years, but because they had to expend so little propellant in order to uh, deploy it to its uh, its lo intended location, it now has a projected lifetime of about ten years. Uh, and that means that the James Webb Space Telescope will still be active when I'll be sending these missions to Venus. And so I'll hopefully at the, at the same time as I'm measuring Venus's atmosphere, I'll be measuring the atmospheres of other Venuses around other stars. And so it's very, very uh, exciting to see all these facilities that come online. It doesn't stop there, of course, because the Astro 2020 Decadal just came out and uh, and the recommendations from that is something that Eddie and I are very excited about because they do recommend direct imaging missions. And so that means that if we go back to the quote by Giordino Bruno, he said they're invisible. Well, we're going to try and do it. And we're going to do it from space and, uh, and we're going to fulfill Giordino's uh, dream all these the years later of finally capturing an image of a planet, which will tell us much more about whether these planets are potentially uh, habitable or not. So I wanna finish with this first light image from the James Webb uh, Space Telescope. Uh, this is when it was focusing on a particular star, but what you can see in the background, there's a whole bunch of blobs. Those are all galaxies. And so, it's seeing these galaxies in the background and each of these galaxies are, are on their own have billions of stars. And once again, uh, it can be an overwhelming uh, problem. But if you've 
ever been at a party, you know, where someone inevitably says, wow, do you think there's life on other planets? It's very tempting to say, well, of course there is, because there's so much out there. But if that's all you say, then you're not saying anything more profound than Epicurus said more than 2,000 years before you. We have had technology catch up to ideas over the past few decades, and, and you can now be that person at the party, depending on what kind of parties you go to, <laughs> that, that, that says, but wait a minute, Kepler showed us that rocky planets are extremely common, and we know that liquid water is, is, is uh, very, very common. And we know that the bioessential elements for biochemistry on the earth, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, are amongst the most common elements in the universe. And so you can be much more quantitative about uh, our, our knowledge about, about, the, this, uh, about this whole endeavor and know that there, that there almost certainly is life out there that's hiding just beneath the data that's coming in the coming years uh, that we'll be able to have access to and finally answer these questions once and for all. So I'll stop there and take any questions. Thank you. So we're gonna uh, help out uh, moderating questions for, for Dr. King. And um, there's a, a Q and A opportunity and so we're going to have three different ways of asking questions. If you're in person, raise your hand. If you're online and you want to speak, uh, raise your virtual Zoom hand, and then I'll invite you to uh, uh, unmute. And also, you're welcome to put questions in the chat uh, if you would like. And um, and we'll take those. Um, so so while we're I'm looking for uh, raised hands in the Zoom. Okay, so while we're, oh, we have a question over here. Yes, please. So what happened to Venus? So what did happen to Venus? Yeah, that, that, is, that is the big question. There's a lot of uh, ideas about this. So like I said, one of the prevailing theories at the moment is that Venus did have water delivered to it in the same way in which uh, uh, Earth had water de uh, delivered to it. So. The water on Earth came from a, uh, a combination of condensation of water out of the disk from which it formed and delivery of water from the outer parts of the solar system. Venus went through the, through the, the, the same process. One of the big differences between Earth and Venus is that Earth suffered a significant impact earlier in its history, uh, which is the moon forming impact, uh, which stripped parts of the uh, parts of the mantle away. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of discussion in the literature about that would have what that would have done for the water inventory of the earth but for venus the the uh the climate models that were run for for venus showed that venus could have had uh, could have maintained surface liquid water uh, up until about a billion years ago at which point uh, a, no a number of things could have happened one is that the sun's luminosity is gradually increasing with time the, the sun uh is 30 percent more luminous now than it was about four and a half billion years ago and uh, the, the, the energy being received by Venus could have crossed a threshold where Venus started to build up water vapor in the atmosphere and push into a runaway greenhouse. Another thing that could have happened is that uh, through the cooling of the interior of Venus, uh, it could have uh, uh, re reduced the convection occurring in the mantle, which may have resulted in a shutdown of significant subduction of the surface, which meant that it lost its ability to store its carbon. One of the, uh, the things I often say about that is that Earth actually has more carbon than Venus. It's just that Earth stores it away in the cupboards and wherever we can put it, you know. But uh, it, so, so it's hidden away. Venus has uh, essentially nowhere to put its carbon except into the atmosphere. And, and that's essentially what, what has happened. Now, I should stress that those are some things that could have happened to Venus after it was about 3 billion years old or it may have always been in a terrible state because there are some models which show that because it is a very slow rotator, then the solar energy you receive at the, on the day side of the planet may have prevented cloud formation, uh, which lowers the albedo, meaning the reflection of the planet. But you get cloud formation on the night side, which has the double whammy effect of, of having essentially a blanket on the night side. 
which keeps the planet warm and prevents water from ever condensing on the surface. So we don't know which out of those is true, but this is something that we're trying to figure out. So we have several questions in the chat, and so I'll read one of them. Uh, Stephen Wheeler asked, because of how thin the atmospheres are compared uh, to the planets they envelop, are we just looking for tiny dips and gains relative to the whole planet's shadow during transit? Uh, is Kepler sensitive enough to make these kinds of observations across the range of wavelengths that would be necessary to make these conclusions possible? So to be clear, I, I assume it's talking about uh, determining the atmospheric composition. Uh, so Kepler is, uh, is unfortunately wasn't sensitive enough to do that. And one of the, another thing to remember about Kepler is that Kepler was only ever intended to be a statistical mission. Uh, and what I mean by that is um, because the probability that a particular planet will transit star is so low, the way in which we make the transit method work is a brute force approach, which is we observe it at hundreds of thousands of stars at once uh, in the hope that some of those will transit. The, uh, the consequence of that is that it means that we're usually observing relatively faint stars. And faint stars are not very good for atmospheric characterization because the ability to characterize a planetary atmosphere requires a very high, what we refer to as signal to noise, meaning that we need to receive a lot of light from the host star to make it work. And so we need bright, uh, bright stars, uh, which usually means relatively close stars, uh, whereas the Kepler stars were relatively faint. And so we, co we couldn't really do that kind of work with, with Kepler. Thanks, Stephen. And, and speaking of uh, the difference between Tess and Kepler, could you expand a little bit on the difference in capabilities in terms of the types of planets that these two missions have detected? Yeah, there's a couple of big differences. One is the one I just mentioned, which is that Kepler was uh, primarily ob observing a whole lot of faint, uh, faint stars in order to answer that question, how common are Earth-sized Earth, uh, Earth planets? TESS is much more designed to characterize individual systems. In fact, the, um, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the efforts of NASA has been to synergize, uh, I know a lot of people hate that word synergize, <laughs> but, uh, uh, no, buzzword. Uh, but uh, synergize the missions so that they feed into each other. And in this case, we have the discoveries from TESS are feeding into the target selection for the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, and, uh, and so that's one difference is that the stars are much brighter and so they're much more suitable for atmospheric characterization follow-up. Another big difference is that Kepler stared at the same patch of sky for about three and a half years. Uh, that means that, for example, if Kepler were observing the Earth, then it would have observed the Earth to transit three times uh, uh, at, at most. Uh, but it means that uh, Kepler was sensitive to much longer period planets, planets that are like the Earth in, in the Earth's orbital period. Tess, on the other hand, you may have seen the way in that animation it was tiling the sky. And part of the reason that it's tiling the sky in that way is because it's, it's anchored to the Earth. It's orbiting the Earth. And that means as Earth is orbiting the sun, Tess also has to orbit the sun whilst Keep whilst avoiding pointing at the Earth. It's one of the, one of the significant challenges if you have something like the Hubble. Uh, the Earth is this enormous, giant, whopping bright object on the sky. And so it really restricts where you can point. And so the way in which TESS is dealing with this is to essentially tile uh, areas of, of essentially galactic longitude as it goes around the sky, uh, which means that it only observes each patch of sky for around about 30 to 60 days. So it's only finding mostly the very short period planets. Now there are planetary systems like the Trappist system, which are short period, and it can find interesting cases like that. Um, uh, but, but that's the those are the main differences. Tess has brighter stars, shorter orbital period. Uh, thanks so much, Stephen. I, I should mention that question was from Nora Kapala, um, and it is 6:01 p.m. And so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to close and thank uh, Dr. Kane, but. Dr. Kane is going to be available for at least uh, several several more minutes to answer continual questions, whether they're in person or online. Uh, and we have several, of course, um, that remain in the chat. Uh, but first, for everyone who needs to leave now, uh, let's thank Dr. Kane.
So there is a, a, a first, is there any other questions in the audience that people have? Yeah. Uh, so you were uh, talking about the, the capabilities of the, the capabilities of Kepler and TESS. So my question is about amplification. So are we talking about sending up with the large spectral photometers because you're talking about a light wavelength or what type of instrument do you think would be in this telescope? Yeah, that's that's a really good question because we uh, we custom designed the detectors specifically for the kinds of stars that we want to look at. Uh, so in the case of Kepler, as I mentioned, Kepler was really focused on trying to find true analogs to our planetary system, an Earth-sized planet that's orbiting a star very similar to our sun. And so a wavelength range of sensitivity for that instrument was selected that would optimize that kind of discovery. So it was focused very much on observing stars like our sun, a little bit uh, a little bit hotter, a little bit cooler, but centered around there. TESS, on the other hand, uh, is has extended its wavelength range to include uh, what we call M dwarf stars, which have, uh, Eddie and I have mentioned a couple of times. These are much cooler stars. They're extremely common, but because they're cool and small, they're relatively faint. Uh, but we wanted to uh, focus on those with TESS because if it's cool star, it means that uh, potentially habitable planets could be much closer to the star. Uh, and so even though, as I said, TESS is uh, sensitive to orbital periods of planets out to say between 30 and 60 days, those planets could still be in the habitable zone of their stars where you could have surface liquid water. Uh, and so that, that's the difference between the wavelength range between Kepler and TESS. As I said, very specifically chosen to optimize the target sample of the kinds of stars. Does that answer your question? Yes. So we have a, another interesting question, uh, actually very similar questions from two uh, audience members, Janelle Avera and, Cass, and Cassie Thompson, who's a high school student and who is wondering um, whether Earth will meet the same fate uh, as Venus. And is it possible that Earth will become more like Venus over time, or will it avoid that fate? <laughs> this is so <laughs> I love this question because um, I I think about this a lot, and I have um, a, a a project that is focused uh, on this very question at the moment called Reuniting Twins. Um, and uh, the the answer to the to this question is essentially yes, Earth will turn into Venus. And the way I sometimes word it is that it's not a question of if actually, it's how and when. What are the processes that will lead to it? How long before that happens? Now, I don't want to alarm anybody, um, uh, but uh, sometimes Venus is referred to as the end state of all terrestrial planetary evolution. Uh, and, but we don't know for sure. And it goes back to these questions about how does this transition happen? So for example, if, if it is a case of either you can re recycle your atmospheric carbon through subduction or you can't, well, all planets are likely going to see subduction at some point. And that could be the turning point for all planets when they transition to a runaway greenhouse state. Uh, and, and so I, I think that's really a key question because especially if Venus did have a habitable past, then this really matters because when we're studying the atmospheres of planets around other stars, we're looking at a particular time for them. I always try to remind people, you know, when we are looking at this subject, especially when we're looking at the planets in our solar system, we are looking at a particular time. It's a snapshot in four and a half billion years of history of these planets. But if you, if we were an alien civilization looking at our, um, at our planetary system, about a billion years ago, you may well have concluded that there's two planets, both with surface liquid water oceans. And that's profound because um, when we're looking at uh, another planetary system, so for example, an Eddie line, look at the Trappist one system, which is actually relatively old. And so that, those uh, planets have been through a lot of their history already. And so if those are habitable, that will be amazing because it means that habit planetary habitability could perhaps be sustained through processes that we don't yet fully understand. Um, but in answer, to the, in answer to the question, yeah, uh, Earth will, will eventually transition into Venus. Of course, there are ways that we can accelerate that process. <laughs> um, 
uh, but, but eventually, I, I sometimes think of the quote from, uh, from Spaceballs, where <laughs> President Scrooge <laughs> says that it's irreversible, <laughs> like my raincoat. You know, that's what that's why I think about when, when a planet transitions into uh, Venus. It's, it's an irreversible state. Excellent. Um, so, uh, Sophia Mendez asked, um, you said that our solar system is structured uncommonly. What would the solar, what characteristics of the solar system, uh, what would the solar system have if it were structured like a common planetary system? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Because um, uh, many of the planetary systems that were found tend to be uh, uh, very compact systems. The planets are close together. You know, when you think of our planetary system, it's very spaced out. I don't know if any of you have uh, been on uh, any of those solar system walks. Various parks have them. Lowell Observatory has them where you can walk along. Here's Mercury, and then you walk, and then and it takes you forever to get to Neptune or Pluto. Um, uh, and so our solar system is very spaced out. Many of the planetary systems we're finding are, are very compact, uh, close together, where you can have several planets inside the orbit of Mercury uh, within our own solar system. Now, part of that is an observational effect because we're more sensitive to planets which are closer in. And so we try to be cognizant of that, but, uh, but that is definitely uh, a feature that I would expect to see in our solar system uh, if our solar system were more typical. The other big thing I would mention here is that we have this really strange gap in our solar system. The terrestrial planets, uh, go up to the size of Earth. Earth is the largest terrestrial body in our solar system. The smallest gas giant is Neptune. And as I showed on one of my slides, Neptune is four times the size of the Earth. And so we have this gap in size and they're even grouped together. And so is that normal? And the answer is no, uh, because we used to think that there was some physical process during planet formation that naturally prevented planets in between the sizes of Earth and Neptune. It turns out that's not the case at all. There is a continuum of planet sizes between Earth and Neptune. And so not having uh, something which is twice the size of the Earth is unusual. And I would have loved to have seen that between the orbit of Mars and Jupiter, but alas. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. Is there any other, any other questions per person? Yeah. Are there any prevailing theories on why our solar system is so atypical from other ones? Yeah, uh, there, there's a few, but one of the main um, uh, culprits in this is Jupiter. So as I mentioned, giant planets appear to be relatively rare. Um, and uh, and there's, a, there's a couple of, of things that can happen. First of all, you don't tend to form many giant planets, but also once you do form a giant planet, they tend to migrate inward and be close to the star. Us having a giant planet further out seems to be weird. And, and a lot of the uh, models show that that's due to the uh, a complex interaction between Jupiter and Saturn, which is that Jupiter did migrate in at one stage, but then the effect of, of Saturn caused it to migrate back out again and reach this stable state. Jupiter is more massive than all of the other planets combined. And so Jupiter, you can think of as this giant wrecking ball, which has ultimately shaped the architecture of our solar system. For example, preventing the formation of the aforementioned super Earth, like a giant terrestrial planet, also truncating the size of Mars. Mars may have been much bigger if it wasn't for Jupiter being there. Uh, and so a lot of it seems to be that this um, uh, perhaps lucky <laughs> uh, interaction between Jupiter and Saturn during the early stages of the fall. There are two related questions regarding JWST that I'll combine which is how far is the James Webb Space Telescope right now? And is there any potential to refuel it after 10 years? Yeah, so this, this was the thing that made us all extremely nervous about James Webb because unlike Hubble, there was no recourse for service emissions. Uh, you probably all know that soon after the Hubble was launched, it was realized that there was a problem uh, with the images that were coming down from it. And so uh, fortunately back then we still had the shuttle program. We were able to go up and, and correct it and everything was fine. And it's, and it's, it's Hubble's still going strong, it's amazing. James Webb has no such opportunity because it is about a million miles away from the earth. Uh, it, it's, it's located so far that there's no real hope that we'll be able to do anything like refuel it or add instruments or make any, any kind of corrections. So we had to get that right. We had to get that right. Um, the only thing that concerns me really about the James Webb Space Telescope is that it might be hit by a Tesla Roadster, which is still <laughs> out 
but anyway. Um, uh, but, but yeah, it, it, fortunately, everything went fine. <laughs> Excellent. Um, are we still good for a couple yeah, more questions? Yeah. Okay, so one uh, question by uh, Vince Reyes is basically asking uh, what methods uh, NASA uses to communicate with satellites that are, uh, that are very far away, hundreds of thousands of kilometers, or even millions of, of kilometers away from Earth. Yeah, that is a process that we refer to as telemetry. It's something that's um, that's part of this whole big data problem because, uh, as I mentioned, the Kepler telescope uh, had th these this huge detector uh, was observing all of these stars at a very rapid rate, producing a massive amount of data. And so you would correctly guess that it would it, it would very quickly fill up its uh, its onboard storage capacity. And so it had to regularly point towards the Earth and download the data. And as I mentioned, Kepler was in an Earth trailing orbit. And so there was a, the, the, when you look at the Kepler data, you'll see interruptions occasionally in the data. That's when the data is being uh, downloaded. Now, inevitably, what we find with these kinds of orbits is that the spacecraft drift in, with time. And so um, things like the, the Kepler telescope, the Spitzer telescope, which I also mentioned, which is also in an Earth trailing orbit, they tend to drift away from the Earth. And so eventually, after long enough, they usually run out of their fuel long before this happens, but they'll drift around so they'll, they'll be on the opposite side of the sun, and then we can't communicate with them at all. Um, but, but that's the part of the challenge. Uh, and, and with James Webb, it's actually really clever design because the way in which the James uh, Webb telescope uh, is oriented. If you guys are all on Earth, and this is the James Webb, the telescope is on the opposite side, and the sun shield is here, protecting it from the harmful rays of the sun. And the and the telemetry equipment are also on this side, which and because it's at a Lagrange point, uh, far away from, from the Earth, but pointing towards it, it, it can essentially constantly be downloading data. So it's so uh, it's really a clever way to do it. Great, thank you, Stephen. And um, I think maybe this would be the last question, uh, which is from uh, Lauren Banulos, uh, which is asking effectively, how do other stars get their planets? What is the process of planet formation uh, that allows planets to be so common? Yeah, that's, that's a great question as, uh, as well. The way in which planets form uh, is uh, something which has evolved a lot in time in our ideas about it, because as I mentioned, that beyond 30 years ago, we only had our solar system to base of this off, uh, off of. And so uh, all of the people who were working on planet formation, uh, they had two problems. One, they only had one planetary system that they had to try and reproduce. In other words, small planets closer in, giant planets further out. Um, and the computational capabilities 30 years ago were not what they are today. And so that limited them as well. Then all of a sudden, uh, uh, people like myself and others started finding weird systems very different uh, from our own system. And so then they had to keep adjusting their models to reproduce those as well. And so it's been this constant interesting feedback loop between observers discovering planets, theoreticians who are running these, uh, what we call n-body simulations. That means they have uh, billions of particles in their model. They let it run over time. And what happens is we find that these particles uh, do coalesce together and start to form planetesimals, which are the building blocks of, of planets. Uh, you can think of a disk surrounding a, a, a star of this material, and it starts to uh, have turbulence and uh, all kinds of uh, inhomogeneities that occur in the disk. And those are the areas where you get air or regions of planet formation. And so now the computational models really show this remarkably well. Uh, and uh, more recently, there's a, a relatively new facility called OMA, which is a, a telescope in the Southern Hemisphere that observes at millimeter wavelengths. So you could think of it as kind of a radio telescope. Uh, and it is sensitive to dust around other stars. And it's been observing very young planetary systems. And we can see the planets forming. It's really incredible uh, that these, that these uh, models finally have that kind of data where we, we see the planet forming in the disk. So that's, it. that's basically the, the process and how it changes over time. Excellent. Thank you, Stephen, very much. I think um, we're going to have to end today uh, the Q&A, but thank, let's thank uh, Dr. King one more time.